you have an apron of fat just underneath your abdominal muscles. So if I go ahead and reflect this back, you see this yellowy tissue here. This is called the greater omentum. And I say apron on purpose because it literally drapes over your small intestines. But the greater omentum serves a variety of functions. It can help to minimize infection and literally wrap around the side of an infection to help minimize how much it spreads. It's gonna be loaded with immune cells, so very, very important for your immune system. And then obviously it's gonna store energy in the form of fat. I hate to break it to you, but this is not called the weenus. I have no idea where that term came from. This is just elbow skin or skin superficial to the olecranon process if you wanna be really fancy about it. But that doesn't mean that this is uninteresting because just underneath the elbow skin is a bursa, which is a fluid filled pouch that you can see we've cut a window into so you can see that it's hollow inside. And that bursa is meant to produce friction between the elbow skin and the ulna underneath that soft tissue. You have a fat heart, and I say that because you see all this yellow stuff? This is adipose tissue, and it's called the epicardial fat, and it's completely normal. It's an energy storage for the heart to pull from so it can continuously beat. Now, if I were to remove it, it would look a lot like this, which is essentially about the size of your fist. You're looking at the thinnest skin in the human body. This is skin from an eyelid, and even though it's so thin, what's crazy is it still has all the layers of the integument, meaning it has an epidermis, a dermis, and a hypodermis. The lub-dub sound of the heartbeat is not actually the sound of the heart muscle contracting. Instead, what you're hearing is the turbulent flow through the blood that's generated as valves, such as this one called the mitral valve, are slamming shut. This muscle right here is called the diaphragm. Now, diaphragm actually means fence or partition, and that's because it separates the thoracic cavity from your abdominal pelvic cavity. In fact, there's no area that I can place my hand to slide from that abdominal pelvic cavity into the thoracic cavity. The main structures that go through the diaphragm are gonna be two large blood vessels called the inferior vena cava and the aorta, and also your esophagus, which is gonna be traveling posterior to this heart here, but it's gonna be connecting to the stomach, which is just behind the liver. Did you know that your stomach actually moves and churns digested material that you swallowed? So as you kind of chew it up and swallow it down the esophagus, it enters into the stomach and then gets bathed in acid, but the stomach starts moving it around like a cement mixer, and then will slowly start releasing it through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine in order to be absorbed. You've probably spent most of your life calling this bone here the collarbone, but its real name is the clavicle. And the clavicle plays a very important role in your overall shoulder and upper limb stability because it's the only bone that's physically attaching your entire upper limb to your axial body. And that happens right here at the sternoclavicular joint. And that joint name should make a lot of sense to you because it's simply the location where the sternum and the clavicle are meeting up. Let's take a look at the appendix. So these right here are the small intestines. So I'm gonna go ahead and scoot those to the side and there it is, that is the appendix. Its real name is the vermiform appendix. Now this has been often and historically described as being useless, a leftover of evolution, but we now know that this is important in immune function and also houses good bacteria that are gonna be essential to a properly functioning gut. You have an elbow pit, but it's probably not where you think it is. So this structure is called the olecranon, which translates in Greek to elbow, so you can continue calling this the elbow, is gonna move in and out of this groove on the back side or posterior side of the humerus called the olecranon fossa. Except olecranon fossa translates to elbow ditch, but that is your elbow pit. So you can just picture every single time you flex and extend your elbow, your olecranon is just moving in and out of your elbow pit. You're looking at the posterior side of a left hip. So this muscle right here is the gluteus maximus. And as you can see, we've made an incision that allows us to reflect it back. And then that can show us these two structures here, which are unique because they're not supposed to be two structures. This is supposed to be one called the sciatic nerve. You see, the sciatic nerve is actually two different nerves bundled together called the tibial nerve and the common peroneal. But they're bundled together until they get to the knee typically, and then they split, but not in this individual. As you can see, they prematurely split. In fact, the common peroneal nerve is actually going through a muscle called piriformis here when they're both supposed to be bundled together and exiting below piriformis. This muscle right here is called the nasalis muscle, and it's gonna do a couple different things for you. First off, it's gonna compress the sides of the nose, and that's gonna temporarily close off the nasal openings, but it's also going to attach down here at the base of the nostril, so that means it's gonna be able to flare your nostrils, and flaring the nostrils can be useful when you're trying to sniff something or just express emotion. 
Let's take a look at one of my favorite tissues in the human body. This is called the Falx cerebri. And this is made of dura mater, which is a very dense piece of connective tissue that surrounds your central nervous system. But this tissue specifically is going to separate the left and right hemispheres of the cerebrum. So that's what you're looking at here. This is the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, which would mean the right hemisphere would be residing right here. Let's take a look inside of the eye socket or the orbit. And if you look closely, you're gonna see a hole back there. And that hole is called the optic canal. And that's the passageway that the optic nerve takes as it's traveling between the eyeball and your brain. You're looking at the most complex structure in the known universe, and that's the human brain. Now, specifically, this area here called the prefrontal cortex is the most newly and highly evolved aspect of it, and it's what makes you human. This is where your personality, your ability to make rational decisions, your morality, your empathy, literally everything that makes you you is right here. I wanna show you why we call this muscle the biceps brachii muscle, because biceps means two-headed muscle, and sure enough, look at this, there are two separate heads for this muscle. We have the short head on this medial side, and then the long head on that lateral side. You're looking at essentially the inner armpit or the axillary space. So you can see the scapula covered in a ton of different muscles. You can see where we've cut the clavicle. You can see where we cut the pectoralis major muscle. But I wanna draw your attention to this little bundle right here because if you look closely, you're gonna be able to see this tube. This is the axillary artery. And on this side, it would be connected to the subclavian artery and then it's gonna turn into the brachial artery which will run and travel down the arm. But we can also see some nerves. So if you look closely, you're gonna see this little tube right here. This is called the ulnar nerve. This this is responsible for being your funny bone. This one right here is called the median nerve and that's gonna be responsible for carpal tunnel syndrome. And then this little tiny offshoot on the side here is called the musculocutaneous nerve and that's gonna go down and innervate all of the muscles in the front of your arm. Some of you are missing a muscle in your abdominal area. You see that white line? That's the psoas minor muscle. The red is the psoas major, and every one of us should have psoas major. But the reason why some of us are missing the psoas minor, and possibly on both sides, or maybe just on one side, is because the evolutionary process is causing it to dwindle away. Everything this muscle does, other muscles do better, such as the rectus abdominis, which is that six-pack muscle that sits in the front of your abdomen. You're looking at a right lung, but I wanna draw our attention all the way up here and you can see part of the larynx or the voice box as it's turning into the trachea or your windpipe. But what I really wanna focus on is this area here because you'll notice that the trachea then just starts splitting. And then these tubes are gonna start splitting. And then those tubes will split and then so on and so forth. And that's because you are looking at the very beginnings of what is known as the bronchial tree. This joint right here is called the acromioclavicular joint. And this is the joint that connects your scapula or shoulder blade to your clavicle or collarbone. Now you can feel this joint yourself if you go ahead and put your finger just on the top of your shoulder. And then as you abduct your shoulder like this, you're gonna feel a divot form. And that's because this joint moves as the clavicle and scapula move during shoulder movement. I wanna show you an interesting structure that not a lot of people know about. So you're looking in the thoracic cavity and you can see the heart here in the middle, the pericardium or it's connective tissue wrapping. And then over here we can see the right lung and then here's the left lung. But here's the structure I wanna talk about. This is called the lingula. Lingula is Latin for little tongue. And it's just this little flap of uh, lung tissue that's just hanging off of the left lung. I've always thought it's pretty cool. Let's talk about shin splints. So first off, you can see we've cut a little window into the tibia here, and that allows you to see the medullary cavity, which is the hollow center of a long bone. But if we draw our attention over here, you can see this tissue called the periosteum. And periosteum is gonna reside on the outside of compact bone. But periosteum is gonna be loaded with nerve endings, bone cells, and a whole variety of other things. But you can see that it's continuous with this tissue here called the fascia. See, as I put my probe under here, you can see that they blend with one another. In fact, they're made of the exact same type of tissue. The only reason we call them something different is because are in different locations. That's just how anatomy works. Well, in shin splints, you can get an overworked muscle which can actually start to tug on the fascia, which can then tug on the periosteum and cause an inflammation. And since it's loaded with nerve endings, that means you're gonna get a, quite a bit of pain. For some of you, this bone right here called the os coxa is not fully fused and depending on how young you are, it might even still be three bones. At least, more than likely, two bones for you. You see this upper portion is called the ilium and then down here and back here we have the ischium and then in the front you have the pubis. And by the time you end puberty, all three of them should be essentially fused together but they don't even fully ossify until your mid-twenties. So crazy to think about that this one bone actually used to be three bones. 
I want to show you a muscle that not a lot of people know about, and it's called the teres major. And this is going to be on the posterior or back side of your armpit. And it's going to attach down here at the bottom aspect of your scapula or shoulder blade, and then it's going to wrap around to the front side of your humerus. When it contracts, it's going to actually cause your entire shoulder to rotate inwardly, and then it's also going to help to bring your entire shoulder down to the side of your body. But this muscle right here is surprisingly strong for how small it actually is. I want to show you a muscle that doesn't get near enough credit for all the work that it does. So everyone is familiar with this. This is the biceps brachii and it gets plenty of credit. But if we go ahead and lift it up, there's another muscle underneath biceps called brachialis. Now brachialis is going to be responsible for this action here called flexion of the elbow. Now, so that means if you're going to lift like dumbbells or some kind of curl, what can happen is this will get bigger and it will help to push the biceps up, making your arms look even bigger. Let's take a look inside of the brain case, or more appropriately named the neurocranium. This is where the brain would just be resting inside of the skull. And I want to take a look at this groove right here. Now, it has a hole in it, and normally it wouldn't have that hole. That's just damage that's accumulated over the years. But this groove is called the cella tersica, which translates to Turkish saddle. And that's because, well, it looks like a Turkish saddle, but what's normally resting inside of this little groove is the pituitary gland or your master gland. So you can kind of picture that you have your little pituitary gland just resting in the dead center of your skull in this little saddle. I want to show you just how massive the lungs actually are. So if I go ahead and pull out these first two lobes, you can see that there is another lobe hiding back there in the thoracic cavity. So as I reach in and pull it out, you can see just how large the lungs actually are. Now granted, this is the right lung, so it's going to be larger because it has three lobes while the left lung is only going to have two. This thing right here is called the xiphoid process. Now, xiphoid is rooted in Greek, meaning sword, or at least resembling a sword. So that means someone a very long time ago looked at the sternum and then saw this tip here and decided, well, that looks like a sword. And I think that's actually a pretty good name. I wanna show you what it would be like if you didn't have a roof to your mouth. So as I turn the skull over, you can see that this skeleton, this skull doesn't have a roof, and that's just due to damage that's accumulated over the years. But this is called the hard palate, and it's normally formed by the maxilla and palatine bones. But due to this damage, you can now see that there is an abnormal passageway between what would be the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. And this can happen in a cleft palate, because a cleft palate is when you have a failure of fusion between the two maxillae, as well as the palatine bone back here, and even the soft palate uvula. And this can create a variety of different problems, including pressure issues in the sense that it's difficult for breastfeeding or swallowing and can even make you susceptible to a variety of infections.